That's the way we have to be. We've got to stand in Jesus Christ. Especially in the day that we're in now, when there's so many things that try to sway us, so many different beliefs that are in this world about who God is or what God is. This morning, we know that there is a firm foundation in Jesus Christ. And we need to stand on that foundation in our lives. And we need to understand why Jesus came. This morning, uh, if you will, turn with me to 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 15. We have many beliefs, or we don't as Christians, but the world has many beliefs. Uh, uh, some believe that Jesus did come. They believe that Jesus was a man that walked the earth. He was a great prophet in their eyes. But can I tell you something this morning? Jesus was more than a prophet. Jesus was the Messiah, the Savior who came to save this world. We understand if we read in the Old Testament, a lot of folks don't like to use the Old Testament. A lot of preachers don't like to preach out of the Old Testament. But to understand the New Testament, we've got to understand the Old Testament to see what we're at now. And we find that the reason that Jesus came, God created this man. Why did He create a man? He had all the angels in heaven, all the created things in heaven glorifying Him, praising Him. But what we understand from the Scriptures is that He wanted someone or something that would worship Him because they loved Him. Not because they had to, but because they loved Him. And God created man. Now, understand that when He created man, He, he does something more than He did with the other creations that were in heaven that were glorifying Him. There was something personal that God did. And the Bible said that God formed a man out of the dust of the earth. And then here it comes. There was something personal that happened. The Bible said that God breathed life. Yeah. Breathed life into this creation. This creation. And this creation, when He awoke and He began to uh, move about, He began to do just that. But God saw that He was alone. and That there was much more that needed to be done. And He created all the fish, the sea, all the fire, the air, and all the animals that walked on this earth. And he gave this task to Adam to name every creature. I could just see Adam as he began to name some of the creations, some of the animals that God created. Can you imagine when there come a giraffe up to Adam and he said, Whew, I don't know what to call this beast, but he named it anyway. And he named everything and when he was through naming all that God had given him, he saw that every creation had a mate. And here was Adam without a mate. And God saw the great need. The great need for a helpmate for Adam. So He caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was asleep, He took one of Adam's ribs and He created woman to be a helpmate for man. And we find that it's cost us a lot since then. Everybody, every man in here is going to need it. We find that this is the greatest creation that God ever made for man. And it was a helpmate. It was somebody that would be by His side. Someone that would help Him in all the things and all the struggles in His life. He found that this creation that God created for him, that he would love and he would put before anything in this world. The Bible says that when a man finds a woman, that they become one flesh, one mind, and one spirit. And I thank God this morning that he gave me a wonderful wife. I don't know about the rest of you men, but I thank God for that this morning. Well, after this creation, we find that man has started going downhill. Started going downhill. We find that 
God came to the garden every day and visited with Adam and Eve. And everything was good. Y'all remember that old devil, Satan. He came to this, he was thrown down to this earth and he found Eve, I'm assuming by herself, I don't know. And he began to attack the very belief that Eve had in her life of this God that she talked with every day. See how conniving he is. And we find that sin came into the world by one man, Adam. They were cast from the garden, and it all started. Sin compounded and compounded, and we find the story of Cain and Abel. We know the story of how sin entered into Cain's life. And sin was born once again, and we find that as God began to look at man, He knew that the plan that had been created before the foundation of the world was going to have to be put into place someday. He gave man every opportunity after every opportunity to come to Him, to know Him, to serve Him, to love Him, to worship Him and adore Him. And we find that there would be a rise for God and there would be a fall. There would be a rise and there would be a fall that man could never, ever attain and be the way that God would have him to be. It came that God said, well, I've got to give them a law. that They will understand that they will have something that they can go by. And they can understand what is right and what is wrong. We know that God gave the law to Moses. And He gave it to mankind. And we find continually through the Old Testament that man never could adhere to the Word of God. Could never follow the, the laws that God had set before them. And then we find that it even got worse. They took the laws that God had created and that God had given to them and they began to amend, add to, eradicate God's Word. If we don't like it, we're not going to do it. We don't like this, but we, we like it enough that we'll keep it, but we've got to make some concessions. We've got to make some arrangements in this that we can follow easier. Can I tell you that God, down through the years, down through the years, saw that this plan had to come to pass. And one day, God shut off His communication with the world that they did not hear from God. And God sent this forerunner. His name was John the Baptist for Jesus Christ. And He began to preach repentance unto baptism. Wow. And people began to wonder. People began to not like John. Why? Because he was bringing the law of God back into place. He was, making, he was talking to people that were sinners and they didn't like that. You remember when he went to the king, he said, you can't have that woman. He didn't like it. His wife hated it even more. She devised a plan to get rid of John the Baptist. Sin. It enters into the heart of every man and every woman when they get to the age or, or to the place where they understand what is sin and what is not sin. And for that, Jesus had to come into the world. The 15th verse of the first chapter. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all exception that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chiefest. This was the words of Apostle Paul. That I am the chiefest. Can we understand this morning that we rank right up there with the Apostle Paul if we do not know Jesus Christ? God sent Jesus into the world some 15 times in the Gospel. Jesus declared that the Father had sent Him and that he came on a mission. He didn't just come to the world. He came on a mission. He came to save those who he loved. 
He came to save those who had rejected His great offer, that had rejected God's offer of following Him and being obedient unto Him. Now sin had taken over and Jesus said, I, I come to save you all. And the sad part that we know of, men were perishing and men are still perishing today because of sin. Because of sin. I don't care how good you are this morning. I don't care if you do the most wonderful things there are in the world to do. You can give all your money. You can give all your time. You can do all these things for people. But without knowing Jesus Christ, you are still a sinner. Without Jesus Christ. Without hope of an eternity with Jesus. Without God. We see that He came to save those that were sin sick. The Bible says in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, that the soul that sinneth shall surely die. Understand that this morning. Now we have those that believe in this life that uh, just as long as you do good, your goodness will outweigh the badness in your life and you're still going to heaven. Well, can I tell you this morning that that's one of the worst mistakes that you could ever make. That your works will not get you there. It's only the blood of Jesus Christ this morning that's going to get you to heaven. Amen. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Understand that. Those are the words of our Lord, our God this morning. And when He says something, He means it. And He'll never change it. And He never lies about it. So if He says a soul that sh shall sin shall surely die, He really means it. And I'll tell you that this morning. Now listen, we find that sin is deceitful. In Hebrews 3 and 13 it says, Exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. We have so many today that profess to know Jesus Christ, that profess to be this and profess to be that, and they lead people so bad astray in their belief. We find that Satan is the master of this. We find that it's, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11 chapter and 14 verse that he himself, Satan, is devised as looking like an angel of light. Be careful. Be careful. It says he looks like an angel of light. The only one that is light is Jesus Christ. He is the light of the world. We find there's deceitfulness in those who imitate Christians this morning. We have contact with folks that says, well, this prophet says this, this prophet says that, my preacher says this, my preacher says that. Listen to me this morning. If it's not backed up by the Word of Amen. God, it is a false prophecy. Amen. And that's what Satan does this morning is leads people into a false state of mind believing that they're all right with God. The only way that you're all right with God is through the blood of Jesus Christ. I was talking to some folks last night that used to live the same kind of life that I lived. And they told me, said, Brother Mike, I'm so glad that I got covered under the blood. I'm so glad that I give my life to Jesus for I was headed down a one-way street and that street led to hell. Broad is the path that leads to destruction. And can I tell you this morning, that's not the one you need to be on. You need to be on the straight and narrow path. We find that there's so many deceived by sin today. How many of you seen the movie Titanic? It was about 50 hours long. But it was a good movie. And what we find is there's a bunch of folks they built this big old boat. And they said it's unsinkable. There is nothing that can sink this ship. And here's all these people want to be on this voyage, the first voyage of the Titanic. And they get on this ship, and they're out there, and they're partying. Uh, they're drinking. They're, they're dancing. They're just having this wonderful time on this unsinkable ship. And all of a sudden... God decided that it was not unsinkable. And it hit this big old iceberg out there and it ripped a hole in this thing that wasn't supposed to be able to be ripped in two. And here's these people 
that are on this ship thinking that their lives were safe. They didn't even know that the ship was going down until it was too late. And there were still those, if you've seen the movie, there were still those that were still playing the, the violin, in this case, not a fiddle. But they were playing music and they were continually just going on just like nothing was happening. They were knee deep in water. And all of a sudden, the ship began to sink even more. Can I tell you, that's the lives of people today. The Bible says in the days of Noah, they were marrying and giving in marriage. They were having this wonderful time. And here we are today. In the same day, it says, the days will be like they were in the days of Noah. People partying. People having this wonderful time. Let me tell you something today. If you're not having a good time in Jesus, you're not having a good time. Amen. Amen. If you're not having a good time in Jesus, you're missing out on the most wonderful time that will ever be. It has not been yet, but it will be one day. The Bible says that the Lord is coming back. He's coming to receive His own. And we're going to spend this wonderful time in heaven with the Lord. Amen. And then we're all going to come back to this place and we're going to be with Jesus forever. I, I don't know about you, but that's what I want. Mm -hmm. That's what I want for me and my family to spend eternity with Jesus. Someone that loves you. Someone that cares for you. Someone that will die for you and did die for you. His name is Jesus. Amen, Amen bro. Well, we see that these people that were on the Titanic were not aware of the danger. And we see today that apparently nobody in this world other than some Christians are aware of the dangers that's in this world today. Satan is in control of this world. We have a lot of folks who say, well, God is in control of this world. Satan truly can only do what God allows him to do. But can I tell you, God has given him a free reign. You remember Job? He told Job, uh, in the book of Job, uh, God told Satan, he said, you can do whatever you will, Job, but you can't take his life. And Satan done some awful things with Job. He took everything he owned, he took his body and created this massive source on his body. Do you know what Job was? He was a faithful servant. He was a righteous man in the eyes of God. And he never turned on God. Satan tried everything within his powers. And if we are true children of God today, listen to me, if we are truly children of God today, that's the state that we should be in in our life, that no matter what Satan throws at us, no matter what he does to us, that we're going to stand in Jesus Christ. Why? Because He came to save us. He came and He gave His life to us. But a lot of us are in a state that we read of in the Bible. We read of leprosy in the Bible. And that in that day was an awful disease. An awful disease. It was a disease that could never be cured by doctors. It was a disease that first attacked the skin of your body. But it didn't stop there. It began to eat at your nerves. It began to eat away at your nerves until you could no longer feel. You could no longer know what was happening to your body. That's the way sin is. Sin eats away at your nerves. It eats away at your flesh until you get to a place in your life to where you have no consciousness of the Word of God. You have no consciousness of sin in your life anymore. It's incurable. It wasn't that day. And you would be exercised from the community. You would be put in a place where people were just like you. Can you imagine today? Imagine in your mind. Today, if... We were all sinners and we were cast into a colony. Can you imagine how, the, how humongous the colony would be? It would probably take two continents to put all the sinners in this world that don't know Jesus on these continents to be cast away. 
to be left out there to die. But Jesus said, I didn't come that you would die. He said, I came to give you, give you life, and I come to give you life more abundantly. This is the wonderful thing about the Messiah coming to this world. He came to save us, and He came to give us this wonderful life. It's, when you get saved, is everything going to be all right? No. We're still going to face trials. We're still in the flesh. We still have flesh. We still have our soul embodied in this rubble of flesh. Things are not going to always be the way we, we want them to be. Paul spoke of those who were uh, of past feelings and gave themselves over to lasciviousness living. They cared not for anything except themselves and what they wanted. When a person gets to this place in their life, they get to where there's no remorse. And the Bible says, Paul said that, they, that the Lord would turn them over to a reprobate mind. Not to worry about your salvation. Not to worry about your life anymore. And I'm afraid today that that's where our society has wound up today. In that season of Jesus Christ return. People don't care about the condition of one another. They, can, they care about the condition of themselves. People don't care in government about the people under them. They care about money and they care about power. I want to tell you that today because don't trust your government. Trust God. Amen. He is the one that we trust in today. We know that man will let us down. We know that man... Will not always do the right thing, but we know that God will always do the right thing because He loves us. He loved us so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to live forever, not in this body. I don't want to live forever in this body, but I want to live in the body that Jesus has prepared for those who love Him and a body that will last throughout all eternity where we'll never grow old. We'll never get hairless. We will always be like we are when He creates this new body for us. Man, that's good. That's good. We'll never get tired anymore. We'll never have to have a walking cane, sister. We can walk around like nobody's business. We can even run if we want to run because we are in a body that's created by Jesus Christ and given to us and it's going to last forever. Brother Roger was talking about the other night, uh, uh, talking about uh, Methuselah. He lived to be 969 years old. Can you imagine living 969 years old in this body? No. That's why God moved the, the age limit on down. But can I tell you that our, our, our children, our children are paying the price. The overexposure of sin in this world is weighing on them so heavy. It's heavy. Listen. There's families out there where daddy drinks like a fish. And you know what? The children pay the price. In the short run and in the long term. In the short term of it all, in the early years of their life, many families do without because of alcohol in the family. Mom and Daddy both are alcoholics. And the money is consumed by alcohol, not by food or diapers or clothes or anything else. It's consumed with alcohol. And then we have the long-term effects is that so many times the children turn into what their mother and daddy was. They turn into alcoholics. And it's not every case. Praise God for that. It's not every case. But it happens so many times. And the cycle goes on and on and on and on. Until one day it turns into this awful mess. God said He shall not let this tarry. He'll not let it go on. One day it's going to end. One day He's coming and we're going to end all these cycles, these vicious cycles of things in this life. And those who love the Lord is going to be carried away. And those who don't know Jesus are going to be left here. This is going to be the worst part of life that they've ever faced. 
Jesus said there's never been a time before or ever will be a time again like the tribulation that they're going to face in this life. But then still we, we wonder why. Parents wonder why, well, you know, I don't understand why little Johnny acts up in school all the time. I don't know why he's always in trouble. I don't know why he's always hitting on girls and boys. I don't know why he won't do his homework. I don't know why he's always dis disruptive in everything that he does. It's because of his home life. Amen? Because of his home life. Unless you're like a dog and just, just don't care. <laughs> Sin is destructive. Not only to us, but all that are around us. All that are around us. You know why? Bob says in Romans the 14th chapter, verse, he's paraphrasing, he says, no man lives unto himself. We're not on an island by ourselves. We live around folks. And sin is destructive in every way. That's right. It's destructive in every way. We wonder why there's teenage pregnancy. Well, can I tell you, there's teenage pregnancy is still rampant today because of alcohol, because of their family life. Mama runs around with everybody that they know. Daddy don't care. Or daddy runs around with everybody. See, sin is destructive in a home and in a life. And we teach our children that this is okay. Oh, not me, preacher. If we allow it, we're, we're teaching our children that it's okay if we allow it. Jesus said, I came to save you from that. Jesus said, I came to save you. We have children that's destroyed by the sin of their parents. We have parents that are destroyed by the sin of their children. Their lives virtually come to an end because of the sins of their children. And they grieve over their children so much. And it has destroyed them. The consequences of sin has destroyed their lives also. We look at some of the greatest societies, countries in this world, and we find that they're no longer anymore. They've been wiped off the map. Why? Because of sin. The sin of greed, the sin of hypocrisy, the sin of not loving God. We find that some of the greatest countries in the world are no longer the great country of Babylon. One of the biggest cities in that time. But they rejected God. Sodom, Gomorrah, and all those, those five cities were destroyed from the face of the earth. <coughs> wow. Because of sin. Oh, preacher, you know Sodom. That wasn't over sin. That will, it was just over the unhospitability that's why they were destroyed. They were destroyed because of the sin of homosexuality. That's why they were destroyed. But today in the society where we live in, it's okay. It's a destructive sin. I know somebody's going to be watching this today. Well, call me. I'll talk to you about it. We find sin is, is, has destroyed societies. The psalmist said he delighted in the law of God and he meditated in it all the time. And he said if we'd done that, we would be like trees planted by the water. That we would get everything that we need that would sustain us in this life. If we meditate on God, if we meditated on His law and what He would have for us, he said we'd be like that tree and our, our leaves would never wither or never fade away. I don't know about you, but I planted grass in a place where I was hoping it'd grow, but it wouldn't because there was nothing there for it to, to live on. Dirt that wasn't no count. Didn't get enough water unless you watered it. Can I tell you, it'll die. And that's the way it is in our lives. When we don't meditate, when we don't follow, when we don't look to Jesus for everything that we need in our lives, we wither up, we dry, we, we, we wither away. Prophet Michael said, he has, he has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. See, we need to be fair today. 
show mercy and walk humbly with God before God. Today, America and the world has chosen a path that leads to destruction and is a path of sin. And God saw the desperate need for a Savior in this world. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all exception. Christ, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That was His mission. That was His purpose. That was His goal in life. He came to save sinners. Remember what the angels told Joseph? <clears throat> for He shall bring forth a son. He shall call His name Jesus. For He shall save His people from their sin. We read where Jesus has come to, uh, to man to seek and save those which are lost. But today we have folks that accuse us of being... Do you remember when Zacchaeus was up in the tree? They heard Jesus was coming. And he was short in statue. He couldn't see over the crowd. Kind of like Sister Vicky. <laughs> so he climbed up in a tree before he could get a glimpse of Jesus. And as Jesus came by, he knew Zacchaeus was up there. He didn't even have to look up. He said, Zacchaeus, come down. Come down here. I want, I want to go to your house today. And the folks began to murmur and complain. Oh, man, he's, he's going to eat with sinner. Oh, he's going to eat with a sinner. Did I tell you that Jesus didn't come to, to save those that were not sick? He came to save those that were sin sick. Amen. He said, I didn't come to save the whole. I came to save those that were sin sick. That need a Savior. That need to be covered by the blood. That's who He came to save. That was me. Can I tell you today? Yes. I, I feel like Paul. I was the cheapest of sinners. And we have so many in this world today trying to take that title from Paul right now. They're trying to claim I have that title in my life. Tell you what, I don't want that title no more. I don't want to be the chiefest of sinners. I want to be the chiefest of the lovingest of God that there's ever been in anyone. That's who I want to be today. He didn't come to show us light. He is the light. He is the light of man. He didn't come to show us the way, for He is the way. And he didn't come to tell us the truth, for He is the truth. Understand that this morning. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Now this morning, you may not have Jesus. The Apostle Paul said, I was a sinner. I was a sinner of all sinners. He said, you know, I was there when they stoned Stephen. I, I was holding a coach for all them men. I was throwing, I was throwing the rocks. He said, everywhere I went, I had a writ, I had a warrant in my pocket. And you know, today you have to have a warrant that specifies what you're doing there, what you're going to search and see. Paul didn't have time that. He just had a warrant in his pocket. It says, if they're a Christian... Do what you will. He said, I persecuted Christians. He said, I persecuted the church. <coughs> and that's what the world is out to do today. Amen. To persecute Christians and to persecute the church. He said, but because of my ignorance, this is Paul, he said, because of my ignorance, not understanding the word, and that's why we do what we do, that's why we preach what we preach, and that's why we teach what we teach, so that you're not ignorant of the word of God and that you will be held accountable when you stand before God. Because you won't be ignorant. But Paul said, because of my ignorance of the Word of God, I found grace. He said, I found grace. And God told him, my grace is sufficient for you in all things, in all ways. My grace is sufficient. It's hard to understand when you're going through things in your life. Paul was going through these troubles and he prayed to God three times that he would remove these things. And that's when God said, look, Paul. He said, I understand your problem." He said, but remember, my grace is sufficient for all these problems. We've got to understand that today, that our grace, God's grace is sufficient for all of our needs. And the greatest need we have is a need for salvation today. The need to love God. The need to love Jesus and be obedient to His commandments. To be obedient to His words. That's what we need today. That's why we have a society that's in the shape and the condition that it's in today. As I said, I believe last Sunday or Sunday before last or Wednesday night, whenever it was, 
that we now have skipped generations of God-loving people. There was a time when families trusted in God, loved God, depended upon God. Wow, can you imagine us? In the day we live, can you imagine us living back in the 1920s? In the 30s when the depression was so great. When people didn't have anything. But God was, His grace was sufficient. They never starved to death. God always provided the next meal. I remember my daddy talking about his next meal wouldn't be much, but it would be sufficient. It would be sufficient. This morning I'm telling you that God's grace is sufficient for your salvation. God's grace is sufficient for your every need this morning. And then all you have to do is call upon Him because He came to save the lost. He came to save the sinner. He came to redeem those this morning that are laden with sin. And what He wants this morning is for you to open the door. In Revelations, He says, I stand at the door and knock. And if you open the door, He said, I'll let you in. He said, I'll come in if you'll let me in. He said, I'll come in and abide with you. If you want to live abundantly, let Jesus in your heart this morning. Let him in your heart. With that being said this morning, I'm going to, I'm going to say this and then we're going to close. God is long suffering. God is long suffering. I can tell you that this morning because God waited about half of my life. He waited, He called, and He waited. And He called, and He called. And I want to tell you something. When I answered that call from Jesus, His grace became sufficient for my salvation. And this morning, He will, yours also. See, some of us here today covered by the blood. Some of us here today and around the world in churches have done terrible things. Terrible atrocities against the Spirit of God, against Jesus Christ. But can I tell you, God's mercy, His grace is sufficient if you'll just call on His name. If you'll just surrender all that you have this morning. If you'll just surrender, surrender it all because he said, I came to save sinners. Paul said he came, Jesus came to save sinners. This morning, if you're not covered by the blood, you are a sinner. You are a sinner. But the most important thing that I can say this morning is, you can be saved. You can be saved. As I get a song ready, I ask you this morning to take inventory of your life. Take inventory. Because He gave His life. Jesus gave His life to save us. He gave His whole life to save us. Now going back to the Psalms this morning. Oh happy. This is David. Oh happy is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sins are covered. Covered by the blood of Jesus. Would you allow Jesus this morning to do that for you in your life? Would you stand with us? Page number 236.